Um, okay. You go. Okay, Jackie, so we're going cannot, live now on Facebook. I cannot see you, Jackie. Okay. You can't see me. That's okay. Okay, so welcome to Hernia Patient Support Group and to our live chats where we get to ask a surgeon questions. Tonight's topic is going to be how to choose your hernia surgeon, and we are delighted to be joined tonight by Dr. Maciej Pavlak from Glasgow, who is one of the amazing European Hernia Society surgeons and my former boss on the um, web chapter at the European Hernia Society. So welcome, Maciej, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. So as we've said, we're going to talk tonight about how to choose the perfect, the ideal surgeon for your hernia. So Maciej, I think you've got some notes you're going to share a screen with us, aren't you? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, good evening, Jackie. It's it's my pleasure to be here with you and um, to have that discussion. I think it's a very important discussion. And uh, as we could see in our patient support group, a lot of pe people ask about that, ask what they should um, discuss with their surgeon, how to choose their surgeon, and what also to consider when uh, undergoing hernia surgery. So um, I've divided our talk into a few sections that I thought we will together go through and 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 make a, a nice discussion of it. So I'll um, try to share my screen. And I hope that everybody can uh, see my pointers now. Okay. Right, so I can see that. So... Where we're starting is ha having a hernia and surgery. It is a big decision, isn't it? And we have spoke about this, that any intervention is going to carry risk. And it's something that as patients, I think we need to, we need to decide whether it's what we want in our time of life. Are we, are we prepared for what the implications are for surgery? Because it's not an easy surgery to recover from. And I think we need to question ourselves as to how hernia affects us, both physically, emotionally, socially, sexually, and financially. There's, there's bigger implications to that. So it's not just a case of the hernia. We have to decide if surgery is the right thing for us at the right time. Do you yeah. agree with that? And exactly, Jackie. I actually wanted to ask you about that because you're, you, you know, you are a patient after hernia surgery. Unfortunately, with uh, with few complications, and um, you know how how um, how was your decision making uh, process? Did you did you do any research? Um... I didn't because at the time, and I, to be fair, I, I I would do it differently now. Um, I trusted my surgeon because he he just done my um, I had bowel surgery and he just finished that and everything was fine. I had no reason not to trust him, um, but I felt that, for mass, from my point of view, it was hernia was seen as a nuisance, and it, it was rushed, and I would hate anybody else to go through that. So I think that is why we spread the message now that hernia, they are important, and it is a big decision to make, and. Yeah, I have good complications and I have um, some small hernia now, but I don't want an operation at this time. I'm comfortable and surgery for me at the moment is not an option. It's not something yeah. that I have weighed up the pros and cons of, of it now and it's not something I'm ready for. But that's not to say that somebody else in my situation wouldn't want to, the hernia fix. It's what's right for the patient at the right time. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right here, and um, that's why I put here as a as an important factor is that you know we are talking about uh, quality of life, and uh, obviously living with hernia is not easy. It it will influence the quality of life, but we we have to think about you know what our expectations are and what our goals are, and yeah. also discuss those um, discuss with those uh, the surgeon. Because here, the first point is that it's a big decision and it can greatly impact your health and well-being. That that that's a key bit. You know, like it's it's not a magic trick to you know to repair the hernia. It is a surgery, very often a big surgery, 
that will involve um, creating scar and inflammation. And also it will influence um, our ability to um, to get to get better to to come back to our uh, baseline level as we call it and um, you know we have to remember that there are factors um, in our, our health that will be uh, affected by surgery and for example if um, if we have a lot of comorbidities we are you know quite uh, frail um, even a small surgery can greatly impact um, any sort of well-being, and and um, and you know that patient could even deteriorate and get worse off after surgery. Yeah, it, it's not always the right thing. Just say going and automatically assuming that we need to have this fixed. It, it isn't always the right option, is it? And there is, we have to say that there is nothing wrong with watchful waiting as a treatment option. Hmm. Absolutely. And um, Jackie, what do you think about quality of life? We, we discuss a lot. Obviously, you know, for us surgeons, it's it's quite easy. Quality of life, um, we, we know it's not can cancer surgery. You know, we, we, we often know that we are not, you know, saving life. We are improving lives. But um, what do you think? What, what, what are your thoughts about quality of life? I think hernia can have a massive impact on um, quality of life. And I see this every day in the in the Facebook group where patients are struggling. And I, I do think that if whilst we're waiting, we need more support from that. And I think there needs to be a better understanding from the medical community about quality of life and just how hernia does affect us. Like I say, it, it isn't just a physical condition with the pain. It does affect you psychologically because, and that impacts on your relationships and your social life and your work. And we have one man who every time I speak to him, he just says to me, Jackie, I, I just want to work. I want to earn some money and look after my family. And to him, he has no quality of life at the moment because he's unable to work. Um. Pain, it is, they can be painful, but we can manage them to an extent. It's everything else that goes with it, I think, that um, that can have a knock-on effect. And I think, as like I say, as a medical community, we need to be a bit more open and understanding about that and support patients through that. Yeah, yeah and, and as you can see, we'll have here a different group of patients with, with different um, ambitions and goals. Uh, you know, your your talking about complex patients where their quality of life is uh, is really poor uh, but we also have patients with um, very few symptoms or as we call them asymptomatic hernia patients yeah and, and you know well, yeah go on Jackie sorry I was going to say if the, if you're asymptomatic and you have a quality of life I don't know that I would particularly rush into having surgery um, yeah definitely Consider you know consider that and discuss that with your GP or your or your surgeon how much you need and discuss it with yourself or with your family think about your goals about your quality of life and write that down you know like it's thinking about surgery shouldn't be any different than you know you know buying a house buying a car you have to think about it you have to make a list of pros and cons and and you know really consider it yourself yeah. I would say that in our Facebook group, we do have the list of suggested questions. And part of that is for the patient to question themselves as well on how the hernia affects them. And it goes back to my mock, doesn't it? That you have to choose the two most important factors to you and what and to your hernia, the two biggest symptoms and what you want to achieve through surgery. So... Do you want your body image to improve? Do you want to be out of pain? Do you want to be able to go to work? And you have to weigh all those things up. So you need to question yourselves, I think, before we go to the consultations and what we want surgery to achieve, because sometimes it isn't going to achieve that for you. Hmm. So um, let's go further. Um, I've put here, don't rush, take your time your research do you agree with that yes absolutely 
Um, the only time you do rush um, and you're not going to do your research is if it's um, an an emergency, isn't it? But yeah, I would I would say don't rush and take your time. And if you don't feel comfortable, then you can always say no. You've got the right to say no up until you're asleep. You can say no at any time. Um, so yeah. no, you mustn't and, feel rushed. Yeah, and 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 again here, um, we are scared. Like I, I'm sure that everybody is scared. You know, there is a medical problems. Uh, everybody has different medical problems, and and that scares us. That causes a lot of anxiety. And you know we want that fixed. We want to have that over and done, be done with. And we we put that trust into our doctors, and we we often don't really consider that you know there are also humans. There are errors. There might be things going wrong. We just want to have that done, you know, to 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 be medically better. Um, and we expect a lot. And 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 sometimes it's it's not right. Sometimes we need to expect a lot from ourselves as well do that research, actually find someone who we can trust, someone who will take us through that journey and will help us. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it is important to, to care, come to that problem with, with an open mind and with time and uh, with understanding that it's, that it's just medicine. It's, yeah. it's, it's really, it really can go wrong. I think we've talked about this before, haven't we? That, I'd like to see this part as being a partnership. So we both have to be equal partnership, equal in it. So patients have a role to play in um, getting ready for surgery as much as, as surgeons do, because you have to prepare. We have to prepare. We have to prepare our bodies. And I think we should mm. look at, whilst you're waiting and everything, as a preparation time, not as um, not as a waiting time, we're preparing ourselves and our bodies and our minds and and our lives for this. And you know, um, thinking about like going further into consent and that discussion in in surgical office, when we are both prepared for that discussion, that discussion um, works better because you know you know what questions ask, what your expectations are. So then we can address them, we can discuss them, we can actually discuss the consent form whenever you, you know, you do your research and know what are are the risks, you can ask your surgeon exactly about those risks and, and sometimes maybe also about their data. So, so that's a, another point, ask questions, but be, be prepared with those questions. And no, no questions are stupid, all the questions no. are valid. You shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. What would you say then? Because I mean, I've I, we've a man who said to me that he doesn't feel like he can ask questions because if he did, he feels that the surgeon will remove him from his list. So, I think if you get a surgeon like that, then he's probably not the right surgeon, is he? Yeah, it's a it's it's a tricky one because uh, you know obviously I agree with you completely. Um, we shouldn't do that as as humans as surgeons. You know, like we 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 are in that together we we should build that uh, partnership and, and that rapport so um sometimes you might have a bad day and sometimes maybe you're not on the top of your game mm -hmm. but i you know i expect the best from from us as people and and even if you have that if it happens you know don't be afraid to say i'm sorry you know i had a bad day and and you can always come back from uh, from that but uh, yeah I wouldn't trust someone who is who's not polite and who is not trying to understand me yeah no I think that's I think it's important to build I think we have to have um, a relationship with you and that trust because it is so from a parent patient's point of view if we're sitting in front of you and you're saying okay then the best course of option is for me to surgically cut you open to repair your broken body we have to place a massive amount of trust in you. So we have to have that relationship where we can trust you. And it's a mm. when we do, it's a very special relationship. It's a special trust that we're placing in you. Mm. And I think you yeah. need as as surgeons that it, it has to be appreciated how 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 much trust we are actually placing in you. But it has to be earned as well. Oh, yes, yes, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, um, we are surgeons should appreciate that. And we should 
um, show that in in the conversation that we have. Obviously, sometimes it's a, it's a limited time. Um, we are under pressure. There are many patients wait, waiting in um, uh, in in our clinics. We don't want to run late because then other patients will get stressed that they are waiting longer, and you know it will uh, affect the report that we're uh, building with them. So you know, with, within those time frames, I, I think it is possible. Maybe you know a broad discussion about everything probably um will be tricky. And a lot of hernias are straightforward and um, they it doesn't need, you know, a very detailed discussion. But I think discussion about risks, the benefits, quality of life, that th those are the basics of that discussion. And then um, giving a chance uh, for the patient to ask questions. I, I would say we, we can do that in 15 minutes. Yeah. What do you think then if there isn't time about using maybe apps like the Acrux or patches where a patient can keep in touch and maybe contact somebody for the questions or through email um um i think uh, you know um we should create um information packages for patients where they um they will find maybe that, that those extra information that sometimes they maybe forget during the consultation and then you know it's it's often happens you know like you're so stressed you go out of the room and you already don't remember it, you know what what was said <laughs> and if you ask that question so on. so I'm I'm certain that we need those apps we need those information and and as you know as European Hernia Society we are working hard whenever we uh, create any sort of guidelines. We are trying to now create packages also with information for patients where most of those um, questions are answered. So you can go, you know, go there. And if you, you know, those are, let's call them frequently asked questions. If, if the answer is not there, uh, maybe you can, uh, you know, um, ask in the forum like um, Facebook and, and so on and so on. Uh, but possibly, you know, um, we, we could in, in, in future think about something more complex, something uh, using AI even. Yes, yes. Um, I have seen one that somebody is, um, is trying to work on and it's looking fantastic. Yeah, I think, you know, future looks bright or, or not, I don't know. But uh, we'll definitely have uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of help. For example, if if I'm concerned, um, I uh, do try to answer to to my patients. I pr you know we don't have we, we we don't have time within our weeks often to you know pick up phones and just have a chat on the phone. That's not possible. But um, you know, calling um, your sur surgeon secretary, for example, and saying, "Look, I really really have those concerns." Can he call me back or and spend you know additional five ten minutes? And uh, we we often do find time uh, to do that. And if it's you know if it's really valid question, I think you should um, you should try that approach um, as well sometimes. And it also will show you you know um, if if that report has been built and if um, if your surgeon is helpful, sometimes we we won't have answered to all your your questions, and you have to be appreciative of that as well. Some questions are not answered even by best research. Yeah, I understand that. Nobody could be expected to know everything, and it's all right to say sometimes, "I'm sorry, I just don't know." And I think I'd respect somebody more if they did say that to me. I'm sorry, but I don't know. Maybe I could try and find out and ask a colleague, but. Unfortunately, in the moment, I can't answer that question. Mm. So, okay. Um, uh, shall we move on to the next, yes. uh, yes. next group? Uh, I don't know. Would you have anything else to add to that? No, to I think I'm quite happy there. If you, if you have got concerns, you can ask for an additional appointment. You can see your GP. Um, I will say there that. that your GP, if you do go for a second opinion, you may be further down the queue. You're going to have to start the whole process again. Um, and if you do feel like you can't ask questions, then quite often there are other advocacy groups, aren't there? So if you don't feel that you can ask, ask the question and there's nobody in your family who can ask for you, social services and the local council can often help with um, patient advocates who can talk 
and explain things for you. Hmm. I probably um would add one more thing that I think further on I um uh, we will have a chance to discuss. It's modifiable risk factors. It's not relevant for all the hernias. It's probably more relevant for more complex ones, incisional hernias. But um, you know, as patients, um, you have to remember that it's it's your body, it's your health, and you know, going to surgery you should be in your best possible health because again surgery will have a great impact on 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 your well-being and therefore uh, the fittest you are the better recovery and um, often we you know we 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 seek help in other people but we are not looking at ourselves and what we can do to make our health better for example if you're smoking cigarettes and you want surgery. That's the most horrible thing you can do because you actually destroy your natural ability to heal. And if, if you do that, you can have the best surgeon there is, but you still win, will end up with uh, wound-related complications. Yeah, what do you think about, I mean, a lot of hospitals now have supported prehab programs, don't they? So, um. And I always think patients achieve better, get better results through those supportive programs like weight loss, smoking cessation, um, alcohol reduction. I think, yeah, I think it's all about marginal gains. And I think this will be the hot topic of next five, 10 years, because, you know, we, we have done a lot to improve, um, you know, our surgical techniques and, and uh, you know, improve the outcomes from patients from, from our point of view. But we know that there is a lot to improve exactly, you know, to the point where uh, the impact um, starts, uh, you know, so everything before surgery. We, how, how to put you in your best uh, form. So how, how to, you know, how you could recover from that in the easiest possible way because your body is, is strong. Mm. And I think a, a research into that will be very important. And um, I hope in the next uh, few years, we'll add a, a bit more risk factors that uh, should be improved and also create bespoke plans for, for our patients that they will be able to follow. I agree with that, have some plans. And I think that that's where the partnership comes into play again, that, um, maybe if we play our part, you can take us to the next level of treatment. But I think the yeah. um, the gain the um, the uh, objectives for patients and the what you ask have to be achievable. If you turn around and yeah. say to a patient, "Or oh, go and lose X amount of pounds," they're going to panic. Whereas if you said lose three or four pounds. At a time, it always it adds up and it soon adds up. But I think that's where the partnership and having that relationship oh, yeah. comes into play. So yeah, Jackie, it is a journey. It is a journey, and I and I know that you can't make that journey too difficult. And uh, you know, and and you you also need to support someone in that journey. So it's it's not only uh, you know giving goals, and sometimes goals that might not be achievable. It's about, you know, supporting um, you in achieving those goals, to checking or, or, or giving you tools. So yes. without without that, we can't expect change. No, no. I agree. Comple completely. So we move on to how to choose a surgeon with the appropriate skills and experience to perform the procedure. Now, then, this is something that I think is quite important because where I'm seeing is for the um small hernias, the, the umbilical hernia, the small inguinal hernias, like we've said, a general surgeon can can perform those surgeries. But for the bigger, more complex hernias, you need a hernia expert, don't you? Somebody who's got experience, uh, like an abdominal wall specialist. And that is something that I've had personal experience where my GP said to me recently, I wouldn't know where to start looking for one. So I think that's really important is to choose that. But how do patients find a, um, an abdominal wall surgeon if a GP can't? 
Yeah, I I don't have a good answer for you for that. Um, I was actually whenever I was you know we we discussed that earlier, and whenever I've uh, written it down, I was actually thinking you know like what would be my advice if you ask me today like how to find good um, good surgeon. You know, we might not talk even about hernia surgeries. For example, I had a different problem. I would have the same sort of issue. Where 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 even to start looking? Obviously, you know. Um, you can we, we can start talking about like google searching about reviews about you know presence on on social media and and so on so on but does it actually give you an insight to their to their skills and experience not really so um the only thing that i i came uh, up with is you know in countries like for example germany you have certification for hernia surgeons and i think that's where we will be going in, in hernia surgery, but also in different disciplines, where by your training and auditing data, you will be able to prove that you are doing certain number of cases per year, and therefore your experience to perform those. And you know you will be validated. We have to be validated as doctors, like regu- or on on regular basis, but not as surgeons uh, in in the surgeries that we do. And yes, I agree with you. And, and, you know, I need to support that because we are all general um, surgeons as well. And, and a lot of cases that we are now discussing are straightforward procedures. And, um, and there is not much that uh, can go wrong. But still, you know, you, you should have that training. Even, even a simpler procedure might not be performed um, well. So, so you know, in a sen- in that sense, you should ask questions. You should challenge your, um, your surgeon and ask them, you know, what sort of uh, training they had in that particular surgery. Do you think this is something where um, registries and databases are useful? I mean, the British yeah, Hernia Society are about to launch theirs, aren't they? Yeah, we so um. You know, but that's not public knowledge, so it, it's de- difficult for to follow by uh, for for patients. So it's um it's more for us. It's not obligatory yet, so it's tricky because you don't have to do that and you don't have to even disclose that. But the European Hernia Society, the British Hernia Societies, are working hard. We have uh, we, we we have registries in other countries. You know, you know, you, you have to do that, like in Denmark or or Sweden or in Germany. And I think we should go into um, in in that direction. There is a huge uh, reluctance uh, because it's additional work, obviously, um, but it, it's it, it's needed. And and you know, if we want to improve, that's the only way to do. We need to learn from our mistakes. We need to audit our data, see actually what's going on with with, with our patients. Um, so yeah, the time will time time will tell, but I'm I'm sure that will be part of it, part of certification. Uh, another part is what uh, European Hernia Society offers, and maybe we should discuss that as well. Is UMS exams, which actually proves that um, you had training in hernia and abdominal wall reconstruction surgery. So it's a it's a European Board of Surgeons that um, since I think three years now or four years. Um, um, give certificate uh, c- certificates to surgeons that pass exam, which is quite complex exam uh, in hernia surgery. So you know you can ask your surgeon if they heard about it, they, if if they if they have um, um, such a certificate. Probably I wouldn't ask. You know, in in cases of of small umbilical hernias, it's it's more for more complex uh, things and um um. Uh, because we can't expect you know all um all general surgeons to be expert in complex cases no so, but, um, but they could ask if um they've done the robot training with the european hernia society if they're having um an unguil- inguinal hernia or umbilical hernia repair th- with a robot they could always ask have you done the european hernia society robotic training yeah well Whenever you know that, that that's a very good point. So whenever you have that initial dis- discussion and you are offered something not standard, so assuming we we you know let's talk about umbilical hernia. You've done your research and you know that you have options for open surgery, 
uh, you have suture repair and mesh repair, and you have your laparoscopic um, options, and you have your robotic options. So, you know, obviously I'm just talking about technical um, difference be, be, uh, between how to fix that hernia. But then if you are offered robotic surgery for your umbilical hernia, especially if it's not big, you sh that should ri raise, you know, a, a red flag um, in, in sense, you know, asking your uh, surgeon, why do you want to do that? And, you know, uh, how many of those have you done? And what's the benefit from uh, for me for, for that? Okay. And then, yes, then you can, if, if actually that person had a training and... Um, and done those uh, surgeries before and can actually say yes, because it, it gives those benefits and my, I've observed that in my patients, then yeah, you should probably decide on that. But it's very individualized, you see, and, and it, it it needs to be that approach, that holistic approach to, yes. oh, absolutely. Uh, to the patient where, where you consider different options. It can't be, you know, like I will operate on you with robot. Always say no to that. You know, you have to get, be given options. You know, those are your options. I would suggest robotic surgery because of those benefits for, for you, mm. not because I want to train on you. No, no, I agree with you. Um, everything has to be for the benefit of the patient. And the same goes for mesh. When we talk, when patients have this um, discussion with the surgeons about mesh, we just say to patients, don't be frightened about mesh. Because if it's used by people who understand it, the risks are very low. But always ask your surgeon what mesh they're going to use and why and what the benefit is for you with that particular mesh. Yeah. You, you know, if, if you're using any sort of device, medical device, um, you, should, uh, you should have a knowledge about it and, you know, why you are using this particular device. Yeah. If you know if you implant if you plan to implant it in someone, you should you should know what that is, what that makes, and what are the risks uh, with doing so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's a it's a it's a next point. We we you know we discussed the right surgeon and right operation, and I think it's it's the individual individualization and actually discussion about that, but also discussing about possible complications because complications do happen. Some surgeries have very few complications, but you know the more complex it's getting, the more complex complications we can expect. And you know, in some um, surgeries, we will have certain complications. We, you know, we are talking about quality of life, and sometimes improving quality of life doesn't mean that you know we will get you hundred percent. No, we, you know, for for example, because you, you, Jackie, you know that I deal with chronic groin pain, mm -hmm. uh, post-operative pain, and and in here, you know, we can't make, for example, groin uh, brand new. We can't go back to a situation where everything is perfect, but we can offer treatment that will, for example, um, um, improve symptoms by 50% or sometimes even 70%. Yeah. And this is, again, you know, sort of discussion about uh, benefits and risks. I, I agree with that. It's not about getting back full quality of life sometimes, but anything and of an improvement where you can start to enjoy some life again that's what you've got to consider. Mm. So um, I want to chat with you about the point uh, number four, which which is the emotional and communication skills. I think it's it, it should be like the separate topic of of, of this uh, of this discussion because it's so important for both of us. Yes, absolutely. So so for me, a patient needs to feel as though we're being listened to because then the surgeon is understanding us as a person and our hernia. You're not just seeing me as a hernia, you're seeing me as a person. And it is a journey. We we talk about that all the time. And I need that person I can turn to and, and who can answer my question and also, in a way, take, take control of it as well. You know, you're... I want you to to give me advice. So I do feel that 
to be listened to, to understand how my hernia is affecting me. And then you can advise me and tell me that it's okay. These anxieties are normal. I'm not just going, um, making a big deal out of nothing. I'm not going to do tap. These Think these feelings that we're having are normal and the hernia will affect us more. So I do feel it's important to be listened to. And it also helps us build trust as well. Yes. Um I've I've you know I, I think it's important because um I would expect that um from a surgeon and I expect that from myself and it's it's so important to be able to communicate um in a in a in this you know transparent and open way with our patients to to show them uh, what are the um uh, you know what, what what they can expect what the journey will be like uh, what problems they might encounter uh, but you know Jackie we were not trained in that you know, in medical school or even in our in our training, surgical training, there are no special courses or you know parts where they will um, show you how to obtain those communicational uh, emotional skills. Obviously, as a person, you you should have you know you 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 should be compassionate if you want to do that job, and 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 compassion is is here is a is a key. Uh, but no, not everybody knows how to offer that, how to show their compassion, because it's 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 not you know like uh, sometimes um, sometimes too much of compassion you know can lead into problems. You can you know then spend an hour chatting with your with with someone in in your outpatient office about like all the problems, and it's also not the point because here we we have a particular problem. We have surgery. We have to discuss it. And you know, up to point and explain everything and show that we care, but you know, we can't go too far. No, I understand that, but I also think as well what you've got in point three, the openness about and transparency. What you said, I think it surgeons need to be very honest about the recovery process as well, because I see it all the time. Or oh, I'm still in pain after two weeks, two months, and you've had a massive surgery it, it's not the sign that there's anything wrong it's just normal healing i think this the proverbial steam train does hit you sometimes after um especially after the major abdominal wall reconstruction surgeries you won't you won't be up and about straight away and i, I do think that we need to be a bit more honest about that mm, yeah we should um let, let, let's move on um one of my favorites um point here and that's why it's 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 built uh, a lot of um our chat is built about is is that partnership in yeah. in care yeah um and i i think we should stop here and 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 chat a bit more about that and and put emphasis on 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 that partnership i do th i i agree with that and i think patients today they want to be actively involved in the treatment and make the treatment choices and I think you want, as a patient, we want to be involved in making these decisions. So make the decision together about what surgery it's going to be. Is it going to be an open surgery? Is it going to be a laparoscopic surgery? Do you think I should have surgery? Let's discuss all the options there. And again, let's talk prehab. Let's work together to get me in the best possible physical health. That Let's have that active partnership. I um, did some presentations recently um, to some surgeons in Yorkshire, and we we talked about. I went. I found some local support groups for weight management and things like that. So it's not if they're not necessarily in your area, but you can in your hospital. Sorry, but there's normally things in the area that the surgeon can refer you to, and I think there as well partnership in care. Talk to us about how we can manage our hernia as well. So in the UK, patients are entitled to binders on prescription. So the surgeon can help us with that. Talk, talk mm. about managing the hernia and give us confidence as well. 
that we we're okay to move because I think sometimes patients when we come we're very nervous of making things worse so I think we need that input from from surgeons that we're not going to really make it worse by by doing some exercise by being walking around and and moving so I think that's where the uh, the partnership it, it's a really important thing and it's really good if you can build that real relationship and have that partnership and I've seen it work in some clinics and it's fantastic when it works hmm. I think it's also about asking questions and managing expectations yes. so you know I, I I want to ask my patient you know what are your expectations what do you want to gain from uh, from that and you know how can I help you with that you know how can I help and also explain you know how you can help yourself mm-hmm um, so, so that builds that partnership, and then together we are going through that journey. We obviously build that rapport, which is which is super uh, important. And uh, you know, we we will discuss further what what happens if 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 you don't build that rapport. Like, should you should you not have surgery? You went to the office, and obviously, you know, there was no enough time. They didn't ask you. You know, your surgeon didn't ask you questions. They just you know went through. The procedure and uh, what they can offer and complications consent and they said you know like yeah that's that's the part where you make your decision is it is how important that is um in choosing your your surgeon i i think it, it is really important is that to have that partnership of care um and that's my biggest regret with my hernia surgeon, I didn't have that relationship and I didn't have the ability, the option to ask him questions. When I turned up for my surgery, he changed his mind on what he was going to do and I didn't realise at that point that patients have the right to walk out. Um, I went in for a laparoscopic um, hernia repair and I ended up with um, an open surgery with um, a week's stay. I hadn't made arrangements for my animals, for my family or anything. And... You know, patients, we need that. So if for me, I would not feel comfortable if I could not ask these questions and I didn't have that relationship. My surgeon now, I, he's a lovely surgeon and he's got that. Um, he, he, he had to spend a lot of time with me as well, though, for me to be able to learn to trust again. And I think that's important as well, because sometimes patients can come across as angry and we don't mean to be. It's just that we've had a, a previous bad experience, but we have to remember that you, you're not all bad guys. Most of mm. you are absolutely lovely and we, we can trust you. But if we've had a bad experience, sometimes it's difficult to trust again. Yeah, I, and trust Jackie, it, it, it is difficult from the uh, on the other side as well. So again, going back to those complex um, pain um patients with you know, with mesh related complications it's especially if you had few few really bad years and um uh, already met you know tens of of uh, different healthcare professionals from um surgeons to uh pain specialists physiotherapist um and so on so on um and no one can take well no one can help you and and some of them they don't even take you seriously because they say, you know, like, I can't help you. Like, I won't do anything for you. I, I won't touch you even. Mm-hmm. And then you come to, you know, someone who maybe can offer you that help, but you're angry. You, you know, you, you've you been there so many times. You've, uh, you've you know, you you have to manage your expectations, you know, because in in, in the previous consultation, maybe you you, you, you felt like, that finally maybe I will be listened, maybe finally something will change, and then bang, you know, you, you are left again by yourself without any help. And and you come to the office, so you are angry, you can't, you, you, you don't trust. Uh, you think that, oh, it's another appointment uh, that won't make any, any difference. It is difficult to get to uh, that sort of, 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 um, of of person and um to destroy that uh that wall that has been built over the years it takes and, a very uh, special surgeon to do that and i've i've i found it 
really tricky. And um, I think the the advice I would give to any sort of surgeon, if there are any uh, listening to us tonight, is uh, is simply to listen and and uh, also to um, discuss what happened until now, what are possible problems, um, show why you um, maybe are able to help and be absolutely transparent and, you know, be a human being, be polite, be compassionate. And in most of the cases, it, it helps. And I built a report with many angry patients and, and I was fortunate enough to help some of them. And it's, it's, it's then the, it's so gratifying. It's mm. the best thing that can happen in your surgical career. Yeah, I must admit that I have a really good relationship with my surgeon now, and it 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 took a long time, and all it took was for him to say that he will try, and to to listen to me and to tell tell me he would try to help things, and I just burst into tears because the relief was just unbelievable. So I have a question here for you, Matt Jay. Somebody's yeah. asked a question. Do we have enough time with the surgeon to discuss everything and how how can we ease the process? And I think that is, again, by being prepared for the consultation, isn't it? Both Yeah, from absolutely. So, yeah, so you, you have to remember that uh, usually per consultations we have 15 minutes and that's it. And in that 15 minutes, we need to go through your file. We need to check uh, relevant information. And we need to have a discussion about all of that, build a report, and then convince you, you know, what's the most uh, ap uh, appropriate uh, means of repair or not repair. So uh, it's not a lot of time. Uh, so it is, uh, it is very important. If you want to get more information, if you have questions, write them down, think about them, think about your quality of life, be prepared for, um, for that con conversation. If it's more complex, um, I tend to, and most of the surgeons tend to have more time for those patients. And, you know, sometimes it's half an hour, but for example, for complex groin patients, we spent sometimes three hours with them discussing their problems. Right. So it, it's, a, it's a lot of time. So it depends what you're dealing with. For a, for a, for a simple thing, it's, it's 15 minutes. So if you want to get the best out of your appointment, Come prepare. Perfect. I agree with that. So, mm. <laughs> so there we've got the guidelines. Would you would you ask your surgeon if they've read the current guidelines? Do you think that's something mm. patients? Yeah. So you know, I've uh, you know, we 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 have uh, similar colleagues uh, in European hernia societies, and some of them are you know like really strict. Oh, you have to know the guidelines. You have to adhere to guidelines. You have to audit your data. You have to be certified. You have to have, you know, everything. You have to be perfect. And often they are not perfect themselves. A lot of surgeons uh, suffers from um, cognitive dissonance. And, you know, they, they don't look at themselves in, in a, you know, in a proper way. And, and I think we have to be here very careful. Obviously, there are guidelines by guidelines to, you know, to explain to everyone. Those are the set of, of uh, let's say, pathways that will help us to have that discussion with you about what sort of um, surgeries and what sort of options we have and what's currently the best approach. So it's, it's based on... Um, on evidence-based medicine. So about, you know, all the literature that we have in that topic. But, you know, there are um, there are things that we need to remember. You know, not everything has been investigated throughout yet. So there are new methods that probably there are not in guidelines because they don't have enough uh, data. Um, some surgeons might not perform all the surgeries and some surgeries uh, that are supported by guidelines that give better uh, results uh, might not be in that toolbox that your surgeon has. Uh, nevertheless, their surgery that they can offer you 
as also very good in their hands because they did thousands of that and they get very good results. And sometimes results between two techniques are, 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 are tiny. We are not here talking about massive difference like that. You know, if you have this surgery, you'll have like 50% chances of complications and and here you know zero no we we are here like talking about difference between three percent to like one percent you know and then it depends on um on the surgeon so so adherence to guidelines is important but you know you should offer the surgery that actually in your hands is the best what you can uh, give to your patient. I think the, the, um, two, the clues in the title, it's a guide, isn't it? It's not as strict. Yes. It's just a guide. It, it, it's, it's, it's exactly. It's to help you. It's, it's yeah. to help you in that um, decision making, mm -hmm. which should be a joint decision making between um between patient and um, and a surgeon, and for example, let's uh, take into consideration a scenario where patient doesn't want to have a mesh, and then you know we can say, oh, according to guidelines, we can't do that because you know guidelines are strict here. You have to have a mesh. It's not true, you know. In certain circumstances, you can offer uh, pure tissue repair, and also you could, you know, those guidelines give you. Um, give you arguments to have that discussion. Look, obviously, this is your option. You can have pure tissue repair, but in that case, um, speaking statistically, the, the, the chances that you'll get recurrence is around 20-25%. Okay? And if I will um, implant a mesh um, um and, and reinforce your tissues, then the chances of getting recurrence fall down to, you know, below 1%, let's say, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this sort, this sort of information guidelines give us, and then it's still up to patient. No, I don't want to mesh. I'll take my risks. I'll still have 75% chances that it will be fine, but... I will not be happy with mesh because if you know if I will end up in any sort of uh, complications, that will ruin my life, and I don't want that. Uh, and you so have to accept that. The guidelines can help build. The, everything comes back to that partnership, doesn't it? And to being able to question and build that, so to know what you want from your surgeon and from your surgeon to know what you want from them as well. And the guidelines, mm -hmm. everything's coming back to building that partnership. Yeah. And that relationship. And, and just because I'm, I'm aware that we might run out of uh, uh, time. So I, I also put here as relative good reviews, because you have to remember that not everybody uh, has their reviews online. And it's no. mostly only um, the private sector has, has reviews somewhere. So, you know, even if you look for reviews online, you might not find them or might not be relevant. So be careful. Okay, so we I think we've got about five minutes left. So what we mm. have to consider is life isn't perfect, and surgeons, you're human. We have to remember yeah. at the end of the day, you you are human beings. Um, even though some some people think they're not, you are human. You can be having a bad day as much as we can. You know, it happens. Um, most hernias are straightforward, and complications do happen. But I think that, yes, they do happen, but it's how you deal with them once they, they have happened and it's being aware of them. So mm. who is... You know, I, I... Yeah, go on, Jackie. No, it's all right. Go... Sorry. You... Yeah, I've, I've put those, you know, things to consider as just like uh, bullet points. I didn't know that I will, I'll show that and, you know, um, we'll read from that. It's, it's, it's really, you know, the basics. You know, everybody knows... You know that life is not perfect, and fail uh, things might not happen and go according to plan. And and you know you and and obviously it makes you unhappy, but um it shouldn't destroy that partner partnership because it can. You know if you are really unhappy and you you know you had complication, then actually you know if you put that anger 
towards your surgeon, you will, you know, you, you will destroy that partnership as well. You know, yeah. um, and if, if the surgeon actually comes forward, explain, look, there were complications. Unfortunately, this happened because of those things. But, you know, we will now offer you this and that. If, you, if, if that partnership is not broken, you, you know, you still can deal with those complications. Absolutely. And it's, it's a next step. We are, we are here, you know, we, we, we've been there before surgery. We are now here, but we can't go back in time. Okay, so we are here, we are starting anew, and we still need that partnership mm -hmm. to get you through that. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. That's the most, and in fact, I think if anything, that's the most important and the most critical stage is if something does go wrong, that that partnership does continue. So there we've mm -hmm. got who is the best surgeon, the best hands, and the best judgment. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've I've <laughs> recently had a as a chat about that uh, with my, one of my trainees because you know from um from different perspective you will have um you'll have a different answer to that question you know um if you are you're, if you're a patient obviously you want you're looking at at uh, at results and you want your patient just to fix your problem without any complication and that's your that's your goal. Uh, but you know, um, from um, from different perspective, like uh, if someone, uh, if if we are considering um, the administration of of our hospitals, they will consider a best surgeon who is you know who is the fastest, who does the most cases and is the most cost cost efficient. So you know doesn't uh, use expensive equipment and so on and so on. So you know it's it's it varies where. It varies who you ask. Um, you you might get um a different answer. Uh, but here I put that sentence because I think it's very important for all the patients. It's it's really about the technical skills, about their abilities, about their training, and about their knowledge mm -hmm. that um you know that can give you the best quality of life results because that's what hernia surgery is about. Yes. Yeah. So and and in conclusion, how to re how to do your research? So gather research, looking at different surgeons. Um, ask around. Use Facebook groups like ours. Um, ask on social media. Um, look at the Google reviews. You check the credentials and certification online. Can you through the professional organisation? Mm. I again, you know, it's a perfect situation. It's 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 tricky. I I don't know sometimes how Google works and what sort of information um you will get. It's it's a funny because um this is a, a result that I didn't come up with. It's AI. So I asked AI, you know, how to find the best surgeon for abdominal wall reconstruction, and that's what AI advised on doing. And it's it's funny because it's all true. But for all of those, I could find things that might go wrong. Um, and and, and you know, how, would you, how would you feel if um, your patient came and started asking you about your um, your certification and hmm. your, your expertise? Jackie, you know, I would love that question because I've 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 uh, I uh, devoted my life <laughs> to hernia surgery and abdominal wall reconstruction and you know, all the problems that come with hernia surgery. So whenever I'm asked, I love it because, you know, um, I'm obviously for it. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from overseas. I work in the UK uh, since six years, but everybody can, I, and, you know, very quickly uh, um, find out that I'm um, English is not my first language. And, um, you know, it's, there are biases and everybody is, is biased. So, um they might not be happy with that and then think, oh, I can't chat with that. You know, he doesn't have good communication skills. I've actually been told by a patient that they can't understand me. Um, and then comes also like other factors, like some people might be biased against gender or uh, against age. I, I, I love when, when certain, you know, elderly patients, uh, especially female, ask me about my age and if I've actually did any training yet or is it my my first surgery <laughs> so you know all those 
<laughs> all those <laughs> questions are, are quite nice if you have an answer for them and then some of them you know some some of them are difficult because they show our biases yeah Right. So I think, Macha, this has been an absolutely brilliant conversation that we should continue another time because we ha it seems an hour has gone so fast and we've still got so much to talk about. But I thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, it, it really has been interesting and I'm, I'm hoping that those patients and members who are watching, they've learned a lot tonight like I have. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Jackie. It it's been an honor and and a pleasure. And you know, I've I've loved chatting with you, and I'm happy to chat with any any hernia patient any day. And you know, uh, just to advertise a bit, if you know, um, I don't currently work in England. I I do work in Scotland. If you're a patient from Scotland, um, we are establishing a hernia and abdominal wall reconstruction center not far from Glasgow in Golden Jubilee National Hospital. So you can seek referrals uh, directly to myself. I deal with most of abdominal wall reconstruction and problematic cases of, of, of hernias and also simple hernias, inguinal hernias, umbilical hernias, and, and also chronic post-operative inguinal pain. So if you're looking for a surgeon and you're from Scotland, I'm very, very happy to have a chat with you and, and try to help you. Thank you. I'm sure that um, everybody will be moving to Scotland for you now, Matcha. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scotland is very beautiful. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you. We we have had, uh, we've got a few people who are watching who've said thank you very much. It's been really informative. Um, we've really enjoyed it. So thank you, Matcha. And I'm sure we'll be speaking very soon. All the best. All the best. So this, uh, just to let everybody know, this will be available on YouTube soon. Brilliant. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Night, everybody. Thank you.